Hello, I'm Julie Dombrowski from the University of Washington, and the title of my talk is A Randomized Trial of Azithromycin versus Doxycycline for the Treatment of Rectal Chlamydia in Men Who Have Sex with Men. I'm grateful for the opportunity to present this talk on behalf of my co-authors. Rectal chlamydia trachomatis, or CT, is the most common bacterial STI in MSM. It is typically asymptomatic and therefore not detected in the absence of asymptomatic screening. It's associated with an estimated twofold risk in HIV acquisition, and if untreated, can lead to symptomatic urethritis in male sex partners. The 2015 STD treatment guidelines recommend either azithromycin or doxycycline for the treatment of rectal CT, but observational studies suggest that doxycycline may be more effective. We completed a randomized, double-blinded, placebo-controlled trial of azithromycin versus doxycycline for the treatment of rectal CT in men who have sex with men. The primary objective of our study was to compare the effectiveness of azithro versus doxy at four weeks based on microbiologic cure. The secondary objectives were to compare microbiologic cure at two weeks and to assess the effect of lymphogranuloma venarium or LGV on microbiologic cure. At the time of this recording, we've just completed LGV testing and data analysis is in progress. This study was conducted in two cities, Seattle and Boston. We recruited MSM who were diagnosed with rectal CT through standard clinical practice. The study also was open to transgender, non-binary, and otherwise not cisgender persons who were assigned male sex at birth. At the time of enrollment, participants repeated a rectal swab for CT-NAT and were randomized one-to-one -to, -one to receive either azithromycin and placebo doxycycline or placebo azithromycin and doxycycline. The first follow-up visit was at two weeks, at which time participants repeated a rectal swab for NAT and an adherence assessment was done based on self-report and if applicable, returned pill counts. The final study visit was at four weeks, at which time participants repeated the rectal swab for NAT. The primary outcome for our analysis was microbiologic cure defined as a CT negative NAT at four weeks. We examined three different analysis populations. The complete case population included participants who were CT positive NAT at enrollment and completed a NAT result for the study of analysis, either two weeks or four weeks the visit rather. Intention to treat included all enrolled participants and the per protocol population included those who met criteria for the complete case population and additionally had sufficient adherence to the study medication and abstained from condomless receptive anal sex during the study. The protocol included a planned interim analysis at the midpoint with a chi-squared test comparing the cure proportions in azithromycin versus doxycycline group and pre-specified criteria for stopping on the basis of efficacy, stopping study enrollment, that is. And indeed, the study was stopped early as recommended by the DSMB after the interim analysis on the basis of efficacy. As shown in this study chart, 177 participants were randomized to doxy or azithromycin throw, and comparable numbers in each group had incomplete follow-up. The intention to treat analysis include all enrolled participants, and the most common reason for exclusion from the complete case population was having a negative baseline NAT. So as a reminder, these were participants who had a diagnosis of rectal CT from positive NAT clinically, but by the time of enrollment had cleared without treatment. Nearly 20% of the participants fell into that group. The demographic and baseline clinical characteristics of the study population are shown here. The vast majority were cisgender men, and the mean age was 34 years. 63% were white, 14% were Asian or Pacific Islander, 5% were black, and 21% identified as Hispanic or Latinx. Just over half of participants were HIV negative and on PrEP, and 15% were HIV positive. 18% of the participants had rectal symptoms, but didn't meet the clinical criteria for proctitis, which was reason for exclusion from the study. So these were lower level symptoms such as rectal itching or irritation. Inguinal lymph node exams were completed for all participants at baseline and only 4% had lymphadenopathy. 
This slide shows the primary outcome of the study, microbiologic cure at four weeks. 100% of participants who received doxycycline had cure at four weeks compared to 74% with azithromycin for an absolute difference of 26%, which was statistically significant. In the intention to treat group, 91% of those who received doxy had cure compared to 71% of those who received azithromycin. Only one participant randomized to doxycycline had a positive NAT at four weeks. The other seven were assigned as treatment failures due to loss to follow up. And in the PER protocol group, the cure proportions were 100% for doxy and 77% for azithro with an absolute difference of 23%. In the comparison of the two and four week outcomes, we see the expected pattern with doxycycline. The cure proportion is higher at four weeks than at two weeks, reflecting progressive bacterial clearance. With azithromycin, however, we saw the opposite pattern with higher cure proportions at two weeks than at four weeks. For adherence and HIV status, we focus on the complete case population for this presentation. We defined sufficient adherence a priori as have taking at least 10 doses over 10 days, notably far less perfect than the ideal adherence of taking 14 doses over seven days. Reflected, this reflected the real world approach of our study. 97% of the participants met this definition with only two in each group who did not, all of whom were cured at four weeks. As for HIV status, the comparison of interest was among those who received azithromycin since 100% in the doxy arm had a cure. Although there was a difference with lower cure proportion in HIV negative participants, it was not statistically significant. This slide summarizes follow-up STD and sexual history reported by participants between enrollment and follow-up. We examined several factors that could be associated with re-exposure or reinfection to determine whether this could account for the difference in treatment outcomes that we observed. As expected in a placebo-controlled randomized trial, however, they, these factors did not differ meaningfully between the two groups. In summary, we found that doxycycline was more effective than azithromycin with 100% cure versus 74% cure in the complete case population and 91 versus 71% in the intention to treat population. Only one participant assigned doxycycline had a positive NAT at four weeks. The cure percent increased from two to four weeks in the doxycycline arm, but decreased in the azithromycin arm. And we found that about 20% of enrolled participants had cleared the NAT without treatment between the time of their clinical diagnosis and study entry. Our main finding that doxycycline was more effective than azithromycin confirms many observational studies, but the azithromycin effectiveness in our study was even worse than that estimated from retrospective studies with the point estimate effectiveness below the lower bounds of the 95% confidence interval derived from a meta-analysis of observational studies. Our results were comparable to a prospective study of rectal chlamydia treatment in women, which found 96% cure with doxycycline versus 79% with azithromycin. The mechanism of treatment failure for rectal CT with azithromycin is not well understood, though it does not appear to be related to pharmacokinetics of the drug in the rectum or antibiotic resistance. The pattern we saw with a higher percent negative at two weeks than at four weeks is consistent with, but by no means proof of, the intriguing possibility that azithromycin may inhibit CT replication or induce a latent state, but in the absence of drug, recrudescence occurs. Our finding of that nearly 20% had spontaneous clearance by the time of enrollment was higher than we expected, and the mechanism for that is also unclear. Clinicians are frequently concerned about imperfect adherence to doxycycline, but we designed our study to reflect real world practice and it seems unlikely that imperfect adherence would negate the roughly 20 to 25% difference in treatment effectiveness. The key limitations of our study were that we had two sites with uncertain representativeness, a cisgender male population almost entirely, and because we studied only one azithromycin regimen, our results have uncertain relevance for alternate dosing regimens. In conclusion, a seven-day course of doxycycline is substantially more effective than one-time azithromycin for the treatment of rectal chlamydia in MSM. Azithromycin performed so poorly that even in the context of imperfect real world use, doxycycline should be the only regimen recommended for treatment of rectal CT. 
I'd like to acknowledge the many individuals who contributed to the success of this study shown on this slide, including my co-authors, the sponsor NIAID, and many other individuals who collaborated. Thank you very much. Please join us for the live Q&A session on Thursday, September 24th at 11.30 a.m. I look forward to seeing you then. Good morning. I'm here today to present performance of the BDMAX vaginal panel assay compared to treatment for vaginitis and vaginosis. I'd like to thank the other authors on this poster, Kathy Camerata and Dr. Stephanie Taylor at LSU, as well as our BD authors. Just some information on myself. My name is Molly Broach. I'm a medical science liaison, as well as a women's health nurse practitioner. Uh, my disclosure is that I am a full-time employee of Becton Dickinson and Company, located in Sparks, Maryland. So to get into the study, the objective of this study was to compare the performance of the BDMAX vaginal panel UVE specimen to the clinical diagnosis from the same symptomatic women. So the UVE specimen kit is an FDA cleared collection kit utilized for collection of the BDMAX. The data presented in this poster was a part of a larger study validating a new test that BD is developing. Individuals that satisfied all of the following conditions were considered for enrollment in the study. So they had to be 18 years of age or older, they had to exhibit symptoms of vaginitis or vaginosis, and they had to provide informed consent. So the methods for this study, four vaginal swabs were collected for symptomatic patient, there were five collection sites, 467 total subjects. As I mentioned, this was a part of a larger study. So for purposes of this presentation, the uh, just one BDMAX UVE swab is under consideration. And that was tested with the BDMAX vaginal panel. The other, suite, other three swabs were used for comparator testing. And in this chart to the right, you can see a breakdown of the collection sites and the total subjects enrolled. So just in, uh, some information on the BDMAX vaginal panel, which was the test that was utilized in this study. Uh, the BDMAX vaginal panel aids in diagnosis of symptomatic women using a clinician-collected vaginal swab or a self-collected vaginal swab. For purposes of this study, it was the clinician-collected vaginal swab. The BDMAX vaginal panel tests for the three major causes of vaginitis, Per the CDC, uh, the most common cause would be bacterial vaginosis, followed by vulvovaginal candidiasis, which is also known as a yeast infection. And then the third most common cause is trichomoniasis. In this graph below, you can look and see at the targets that the, um, the max vaginal panel is looking for. Um, for purposes of this study, three separate result reports were considered candida, trichomonas vaginalis, and bacterial vaginosis. In terms of the clinical impression, the clinicians recorded patient symptoms, and patient symptoms were considered to be normal vaginal discharge, painful or frequent urination, vaginal itching, burning, or irritation, painful or uncomfortable intercourse, vaginal odor, or a recurrent condition of vaginitis. Then in terms of the clinical signs that the clinician would record, they were recording in information on the vaginal discharge aspect. So essentially, normal discharge was considered negative. A thick, white, or curdy discharge, cottage cheese, was considered candidiasis. Copious yellow-green to gray malodorous, sometimes frothy, trichomonas vaginalis. A thin, homogenous, grayish, or off-white discharge, BD, or bacterial vaginosis. And the clinicians also had another option. If they didn't feel that the vaginal discharge really fit into any of these categories, they could describe it themselves and uh, write in their own diagnosis based on those observations. The clinicians also recorded their diagnosis that was on the day of the study visit and any treatment that was given on the day of the study visit. And just of note, the BDMAX vaginal panel results were not available on the day of the study visit. The BDMAX vaginal panel is run on an instrument where 24 samples are processed in approximately three hours. So in a normal lab scenario, when this uh, specimen is being sent off, the results are usually given back the end of the day, the next day, the following day, depending on day lot, um, 
on lab volume. But again, it's not a point of care test, so it would not be available for the clinician to use as a part of their diagnosis in this, uh, in this part of the study. So when we look at the results, we compared the BD max result, which gives a qualitative yes or no result for all of these conditions. Those are the only two options. There's no intermediate or um, equivocal category for this, it's either positive or negative. And we compared those results to the treatment on the day of the study visit based on the clinical. So as we can see in this first column, 101 out of 245, so 41% of women who are later determined to be positive for BV on the BD max vaginal panel did not receive treatment on the day of the study visit based on clinical impression. And in terms of our statistics, uh, positive percent, percent agreement between the uh, max result and the clinical impression was 76.6%, negative percent agreement 63.8%, overall percent agreement was 69%. When we go on to the results for Canada or yeast infections, again, we compared that BD max result, which would be positive or negative, to the clinical impression. So in this case, um, we can see that 78 out of 146 women, so 53% of women who did not have a Canada infection per the later max result, did not um, actually receive treatment on the day of the study visit. But this could have resulted in an overtreatment of women who received empiric on the day of the empiric treatment on the day of the study visit, and then it was later found out that they were uh, maxed by the BD max vaginal or negative by the BD max vaginal panel. And then finally, when we look at Trichomonas vaginalis, so in this case, 18 out of 25, so 72 percent of the women who were later found to be positive by the BD max for Trichomonas did not receive treatment. And the positive percent agreement was 87.5%, negative percent agreement was 96.1%, and overall percent agreement was not. So from these results, it's easy to see that vaginitis is difficult to diagnose just in office based on a condi condition such as vaginal discharge, because so much of these symptoms overlap, and there's often a case where patients are actually co-infected with more than one of these conditions. So as we can see, in all three of these most common causes of vaginitis, so BV, yeast infections, and TRIC, all of these women often present with abnormal vaginal discharge. Um, a lot of them will also have pelvic or vulvar discomfort or irritation, odor accompanies both bacterial vaginosis and TV. Inflammation can be seen in um, some of these conditions. And we, when we look at a recent study uh, published by Dr. Gatos from Johns Hopkins, um, she observed infections of BB, BBC or TV in 75% of women uh, approaching to the clinic with these symptoms of vaginitis. And among those, a striking amount, 28% had a co-infection. And in this chart all the way to the right, you can sort of see the overlap of these three conditions. BV is uh, considered the most common cause of vaginitis, and that was also found in this study. But you can see the co-infections as well. Um, so again, symptom overlap and co-infection can result in improper diagnosis and treatment when you only rely on in-office methods, such as patient symptom report and an exam of the patient in office. And this can lead to the potential requirement for repeat office visits if another diagnostic isn't run at the first visit in order to properly diagnose that patient. So in conclusion, the BDMAX vaginal panel detected a significant number of vaginal infections caused by trichomonas vaginalis and vaginosis that went undetected and untreated on the day of specimen collection. But on the other hand, some women that were treated for vulvovaginal candidiasis may have been overtreated as their BD max vaginal panel result later came back as negative for vulvovaginal candidiasis. And in support of this study, um, some other data from a recent study from Hillier et al. that enrolled 303 women with vaginitis symptoms at eight University of Pittsburgh Medical Center affiliated clinics. In that study, it was found that 42% of women having vaginitis symptoms received inappropriate treatment, 
And women without infections who received empiric treatment were more likely to have recurrent visits within 90 days. So this study, um, along with the results of this study, show that um, if a, women, a, a woman doesn't have an infection and is treated for something, this can cause harm to the healthcare system as well. So empiric treatment, which has traditionally been thought as not really causing any issues, it's been shown that this really can lead to recurrent visit, visits, um, increased burden on the healthcare system. So it's really important to diagnose and treat women correctly based on accurate diagnostic results. Um, and the availability of the BD Max vaginal panel will improve accurate diagnosis of vaginitis and vaginosis and facilitate this targeted treatment by being able to provide a highly sensitive diagnostic tool that can um, separate out these three causes of vaginitis um, and direct clinicians to prescribe that appropriate therapy. And with the results coming back, usually within 24 to 48 hours, this should be quick enough to uh, not provide that empiric therapy and, and diagnose correctly based on those results. In terms of my contact information, this is my email and my cell phone number. And I really thank you for your time and attention today. Thanks. Hi, I'm Casey Copen, and I'm a behavioral scientist from the Division of STD Prevention. And today I'm going to talk to you about my project titled Recent Anal Sex Behaviors and Sexual Positioning Preferences Among Men Who Have Sex With Men. This topic really piqued my interest because I wanted to explore the rich sexual behavior data from the ongoing Network Epidemiology of Syphilis Transmission Study, or NEST. Meta-analyses have shown that the probability of HIV acquisition is 13 times higher among MSM who have receptive anal sex compared with those who have only inserted anal sex. Given that MSM account for the majority of primary and secondary syphilis cases in the U.S., there's concern that MSM who practice receptive anal sex may be more likely to present with secondary syphilis. MSM who engage in versatile anal sex behaviors, or those who engage in both receptive and insertive anal sex, increase the risk of both acquiring and transmitting HIV and STI to their partner. Secondly, gonorrhea and chlamydia among MSM can occur in the urethra, pharynx, or rectum, and extragenital STI are often asymptomatic and can be difficult to detect. So for this reason, the CDC screening guidelines recommend testing sexually active MSM at least annually at all three anatomical sites of exposure, regardless of condom use. So why do we care about measuring sexual positioning preferences? Measuring sexual positioning preferences among MSM are important for understanding STI transmission because it's important to get a baseline level of versatility in an MSM population to know who may be more likely to acquire HIV or STI through receptive anal sex and transmit through insertive anal sex. And it's important to understand the level of discordance between preferences and recent um, sexual behavior. So what proportion of those identifying as bottom, for example, had insertive anal sex that must be, must be more li um, likely to be at risk for a urethral STI? How does the level of discordance vary by study site? These questions will be addressed in this talk for this specific population of NEST participants. So the aim of the current project was to assess variation in recent anal sex behaviors by sexual positioning preferences among MSM who, were, who participated in the NEST study. The NEST study contract was awarded in May 2017 and is ongoing until April 2021. Grantees include Baltimore City Health Department, Ohio State University, and the University of Illinois at Chicago. The primary objective of NEST is to understand how the structure and composition of social and sexual networks of MSM change over time and contribute to the transmission of syphilis. The study population includes MSM age 18 and older who identify as male, report male sex at birth, and reported oral or anal sex with a man in the past six months. The goal is to collect data from at least 240 MSM at each site, and I will be discussing results from two sites that have already met this target from data collected January 2019 through February 2020, Baltimore, Maryland, and Columbus, Ohio. These men were recruited using respondent-driven sampling methods um, involving clinician and DIS referral, flyers at community events, and social media advertising. 
Each participant is followed up every three months for up to two years. So some of the data elements include a behavioral survey that includes individual demographic and behavioral measures, enumeration of all persons they had sex with in the past three months, and the date of last sex with them. And from this list, uh, partner level information is collected from the three most recent sex partners that includes demographic characteristics of that partner, frequency of sex by sex act, condom use, and the participants HIV and STI status and use of PrEP or antiretroviral therapy. So I'm going to be discussing data drawn from the first three elements of the survey listed in the top row in blue and the other important data elements of NEST are shown in gray. So participants were asked what their sexual positioning preference was, and each of the labels was defined within the categories. Top was defined as insertive partner, versatile top defined as usually the ins insertive partner, sometimes the receptive partner, and so on. Um, Nest captures oral sex, anal sex, rimming, and vaginal sex behaviors with each of the three partners in the past three months. I created a measure that summarizes anal sex activity ac across the three most recent partners into four categories, having both insertive and receptive anal sex, only insertive anal sex, only receptive anal sex, and no anal sex in the past three months. So this table shows the demographic characteristics of 407 MSM in Baltimore and 241 in Columbus. The mean age was 30 at each site, but you can see the age range was older in Columbus than, the, than in Baltimore. The Baltimore sample of MSM was 71% African American, 18% white, and 9% Hispanic, while the Columbus site was majority white at 65%. You can see the majority of MSM at both sites identified as gay, and about 20% in Baltimore and 16% in Columbus identified as bisexual. So this site, um, this table shows the number of partners that participants named in the past three months at, at their first baseline study visit. So for Baltimore, this means that 407 participants named 1,558 sex partners, and the mean number of partners was 3.9, ranging from one to 80 partners. The 241 participants in Columbus named 1,091 partners. And the mean number was 4.6. And here the range was much narrower, with participants naming uh, from 1 to 25 partners. In Baltimore, there was an even split between those who, I, who described their positioning preference as top, versatile top, or versatile. And then lower percentages reporting versatile bottom or bottom. And in Columbus, similar percentages described their preference with some level of versatility. And lower percentages described their preferences for only top or only bottom. This slide provides you with the prevalence of versatile anal sex behaviors in both sites. You can see here that 45% of MSM in Baltimore and 37% of those in Columbus reported both insertive anal sex and receptive anal sex in the past three months. And it's important to note that 8.2% of MSM in Baltimore and, and about 15% in Columbus reported no anal sex behaviors with any of the three most recent partners in the past three months. So this graph shows that anal sex positioning preferences are correlated with recent anal sex behaviors, but there is discordance. So looking at the blue bars, the, per the percentage who had both receptive anal sex and insertive anal sex increases as you move towards preferences for versatility to the highest of 71%. And then it decreases as, pre as preferences move towards preferring receptive anal sex. You can see high levels of concordance in those that describing their preference as top, more likely to engage in, in insertive anal sex in green, and those describing their preference as bottom more likely to engage in receptive anal sex in yellow. Focusing next on discordance in sexual positioning preference and anal sex behavior, you can see that those that identify as top, 12%, 12 had no anal sex at all, and about 12% had either receptive anal sex only or both receptive and insertive anal sex. Moving to those who describe their preference as bottom, about 10% had no receptive anal sex and almost, or, and no, or no anal sex at all, excuse me, and almost one quarter, 23%, had both insertive and receptive anal sex in the past three months. 
So for Columbus, the distribution of having um, insertive and receptive anal sex in the blue, it's not as bell curve shaped as Baltimore. And this is because the concordance between sexual positioning preference and anal sex behavior is higher in Columbus than in Baltimore, with lower percentages describing their preference as top having sex other than insertive anal sex. Um, you can see that's only, um, only those about 5% had both receptive and insertive anal sex. And those um, describing their preference as bottom, about 13% had no anal sex or had, uh, and only 3% had both insertive and receptive anal sex. And we can remember from the last slide that in Baltimore, it was, it was over 20%. So as a summary to the previous two slides, to highlight the percent discordance in sexual positioning preferences and recent anal sex behaviors, you can see that discordance between the two is higher in Baltimore than Columbus, with almost one quarter of those describing their preferences top reporting anal sex behavior that was not solely insertive, compared with about 5% in Baltimore. I mean, sorry, 5% in Columbus. So similarly, 33% of men describing their preference as bottom in Baltimore um, had um, anal sex that was not solely receptive compared with 17% in Columbus. Also, just looking down the rows between tops and bottoms, it appears that those describing their preference as bottom had more discordant anal sex behaviors with their preferences than those described as top. Sexual positioning preferences um, are correlated with recent anal sex behaviors in this sample of MSM, but we, can, we know that there is variation in the types of anal sex behaviors across positioning preference groups. And as we saw, there was variation across sites. For those describing their preference only as top or bottom, it was those described as bottom that had more discordance between their preferences and their behavior. And it should be mentioned that a sizable proportion of MSM across um, preferences. Um, between 4 and 18 percent reported no anal sex in the past three months. So this is important when thinking about other forms of sexual activity that can spread extragenital STI infection. So data collected at, uh, um, on anal sex behaviors among MSM is important because it helps with interpreting trends and rates of diagnosed STI and identifies gaps in adherence to STI screening guidelines. A measure of sexual positioning preference is, is one way to collect information about motivations for these behaviors, both within and between sexual partnerships. Future work using NEST can address partner characteristics that can, that can provide contextual information about the choice of sexual position, such as drug use, PrEP status, and app use, and how this contributes to STI and HIV exposure. Thank you. Hello, my name is Karen Wendell. I'm the director of the Medi Denver Prevention Training Center. And today I'm gonna to be talking to you about the Colorado Sexual Health Service Assessment, service gaps, and technical assistance opportunities. Nationally, we've seen increases in STI rates and Colorado has seen the same dramatic increases. From 2014 to 2019, chlamydia increased 19%, gonorrhea 100%, and in Colorado, syphilis increased 147% with associated increases in cases and rates of congenital syphilis. To address this problem, a collaboration was formed between the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment, which is the state health department, the CDC funded STI Regional Prevention Training Center, which is the Denver Prevention Training Center for Colorado, and National Coalition of SD Directors, NCSD. The goals of coming together were to define existing STI services in Colorado, identify service gaps, and then develop a comprehensive STI capacity building plan to be conducted by the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment in collaboration with the Denver Prevention Training Center. To do this, we used NCSD's web-based sexual health service assessment. 3,000 providers have been assessed with this tool nationally. It defines sexual health services and Colorado adapted this to really fit the key needs and opportunities in Colorado and distributed it across um, Colorado programs between October of 2019 and February of 2020. Data was analyzed using SAS 9.4. Methods of recruitment included email invitation, which delivered an online link to the survey, 160 different programs that were identified through CDPHE and the Denver Prevention Training Center re received this survey. 
We then followed up with phone calls to programs that had not yet responded. And we presented the survey and the importance of collecting this assessment data to the Denver Metro STI Coalition in November of 2019. The Denver Metro STI Coalition is a collaborative impact group with over 20 programs participating to try to improve STI services in the Denver Metro area for clients that have been affected by the STI epidemic. The assessment really asked questions that fall into three different categories, clinical characteristics, services for STI and HIV prevention, and identified, self-identified technical assistance needs. For clinic characteristics, we collected data on clinic type, population served, visit volume, days and hours of operation of the programs, the presence of gender affirming policies and environments, and funding, billing, and fees that the clinics and programs um, used to support their services. STI and HIV services were assessed, including sexual history taking, substance abuse assessments, lab services that were available, treatment availability, provision of partner services, and HIV prevention services, including pre-exposure prophylaxis, post-exposure prophylaxis, and the availability of rapid ART. When we assessed technical assistance needs, they fell into primarily three different buckets, protocols for STI and HIV prevention, diagnosis and management, skills development, such as wet preparation courses, and clinical updates for both STI and HIV prevention, diagnostics and management. We surveyed over 160 programs, 86 programs participated and completed the survey and returned it for a 54% response rate. You can see that we had a wide variety of clinics um, over Colorado State, with the majority of clinics really falling into these three categories, school-based clinics, federally qualified healthcare centers, private practices, and family planning clinics, with a lower amount of local health departments responding. What we identified uh, for access to services was notable for 43% of programs reporting having weekend hours or evening hours, 30%, 34% of programs were able to provide services to clients at no fee if needed. 89% were able to provide a sliding scale fee for those who did not have access to insurance. And 86% were able to maintain some of their services by directly billing insurance. You can see how these programs um, were distributed over Colorado. This cluster here represents the Denver metropolitan area. To the south, we see clinics and programs that correspond to the Colorado Springs area. And then there are a smattering of clinics that you see in the southwest of the state. The Denver metro area um, really made up the majority of responding programs. You can see this blown up here to the right. The irregularly shaped region is Denver County and then the four surrounding counties here. And you can see that majority of clinics really fall in this area, which really corresponds to the primary area of heat maps for gonorrhea, chlamydia, and syphilis. To look at um, affirming care, we assess multiple different questions, but uh, probably most importantly among them was the ability to collect information for gender identity and sexual orientation or SOGI data. And we assessed uh, what percentage of different types of clinics were able to collect this data. You can see that um, the, the greatest number of clinics really that responded were school-based FQHC and private practices we already discussed, and they did a tremendous job in collecting SOGI information. However, there were other clinics that had greater difficulty or had a lack of collection of this data, including retail clinic sites, some aid service organizations, hospital affiliated clinics, community based centers, and even local health departments. And as you can all appreciate, collecting SOGI information is really critical to identifying needs for extragenital testing, HIV counseling, risk reduction, and other HIV prevention services. We also looked at really providing environments of care that were comfortable and affirming to communities and provided materials that were needed in a culturally competent way. And one of the ways that we addressed this in the survey was to look at the percent of clinics that were reporting waiting room materials that were really targeted or available um, and addressing needs of those in the LGBTQ community and people of color. And what you can see here is that several clinics did quite well. Um, several of them really correspond to the clinics that also did well in collecting SOGI information. 
But there seems to be a bit of a disconnect. Um, <clears throat> more of the clinics really reported having availability of materials focused at LGBTQ populations, but far less of the clinics had materials that were addressing in a culturally competent way people of color. And so you can see in particular clinics that were um, really needing some capacity building in this regard included retail clinics, local health departments, private practices, and some FQHCs. As we look across all clinics to look at STI services, we assess both the capacity to do testing, uh, diagnostic and screening, and to provide treatment for STIs and HIV. And as you can see, there was a high capacity to do testing, both screening and confirmatory testing for HIV diagnosis. Um, there was a good capacity to do syphilis testing, but a very limited ability to do treatment with 60% or less of clinics really able to provide that syphilis treatment. And then gonorrhea and chlamydia testing uh, diagnostics were a bit more limited, and this had to do primarily with the availability of extragenital testing. Less than 25% of clinics had the ability to provide EPT. And so this was a clear target for capacity building in the state. As we look at HIV prevention services, uh, the clinics and programs were doing quite well in prevention counseling and providing linkage to care for patients newly diagnosed with HIV, but PrEP provision was more limited and is clearly a target for um, capacity building, as is provision of rapid antiretroviral therapy with only 15% of clinics able to provide that. Technical assistance requests were uh, co collated, 48 training requests were received, 39% for STI protocols for diagnostic and management, 23% for PrEP training. But as you can see, only 4% of programs identified culturally competent care as an area needing capacity building assistance in their program. As we look across all the information provided by the survey, we can really block um, the needs into four main areas. Expanded access to care in the form of greater hours and evening and weekend hours and greater distribution of clinics providing STNI prevention services across the state building affirming care, especially focused at um, communities of color and collection of SOGI information and improving that quality and um, capacity for affirming environments and expanding services and provision of EPT, syphilis treatment, extragenital testing, provision, provision of PrEP and rapid access to ART. In conclusion, multi-level collaboration proved to be highly effective in this assessment with collaboration from NCSD, our state health department and a Denver PTC, the Colorado STI assessment identified key strengths across the state and clear targets for te technical assistance and capacity building. This assessment will build capacity and in interventions for delivery of STI services and treatment across the state and then in the Denver Metro. We hope that this provides a good example for providing an assessment that guides limited capacity building um, and technical assistance capabilities um, to really maximize those services in a jurisdiction. These are a list of my collaborators. Thank you for your attention. Hi, my name is Karen Bauer. I'm the evaluator for the Infectious Diseases Education and Assessment, or IDEA program at the University of Washington. Today, I'm going to share with you the results of our evaluation entitled, Leveraging E-Learning Infrastructure in Times of Rapid Change, Use of the National STD Curriculum in the Era of COVID-19. First off, I'm happy to present today on behalf of my co-authors, Dr. Gretchen Snow and Bus Newman, Ken Unruh, Andrew Karpinko, Dr. David Spock, and Dr. Christine Johnston. Let's begin with some historical context for this evaluation. The World Health Organization declared COVID-19 a pandemic on March 11th, 2020, and shortly thereafter, the US declared a national emergency on March 13th. As a result of these declarations and subsequent shelter-in-place orders, traditional in-person trainings came to a complete halt. The National STD Curriculum, or NSTDC, was uniquely poised to meet these shifting training needs through its existing e-learning infrastructure and learning group functionality. Before we dig into the data and analysis, let's start with a little bit of technical context about the National STD Curriculum. The National STD Curriculum integrates the most recent CDC STD treatment guidelines into a free, up-to-date e-learning platform that is funded by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. The site addresses the epidemiology, pathogenesis, clinical manifestations, diagnosis, management, and prevention of STDs. The website has seven self-study modules, 17 question bank topics with more than 150 interactive board review style questions. 
It offers modular learning in any order with a progress tracker. Learners can earn 23 free CME credits and CME contact hours and 11 pharmacology CE for advanced practice nurses. But most importantly for this evaluation, the National STD curriculum also has novel learning group functionality, which I'll elaborate on in the coming slides. Before we dig into the learning groups, I'd like to share some overall site use data to give you some additional background on the scope and the reach of the National STD curriculum. This map represents all the users that have visited the website since its launch in February 2017. Each of those tiny little dot dots represents at least one learner located in that city. According to Google Analytics, over 268,000 learners, both registered and unregistered, have visited the site and there have been over 4 million page views so far. More than 41,000 learners have registered on the National STD curriculum since its launch. Learners register in order to track their progress and earn CE credits or certificates of completion. Registered learners are located in all 50 states and major U.S. territories, as well as 160 countries. More than 89,800 CNE contact hours, 21,600 CME credits, and 58,700 certificates of completion have been awarded so far. The certificates of completion are for learners who need to demonstrate that they've completed the coursework but do not need to earn CE. Usually this is for students. And finally, more than 480 learning groups have been created so far. So now let's look a little bit more deeply at the novel learning group functionality. Learning groups help educators and managers streamline the process of organizing training and monitoring learner group, learner progress, performance, and completion. This screenshot here shows an example of a learning group's dashboard. Educators and managers use the learning group functionality to assign content, monitor group members' progress and completions, analyze aggregated performance for further training, and email members reminders or comments. For this evaluation, we wanted to understand how the COVID-19 pandemic impacted learners' use of the National STD Curriculum e-learning platform. We analyzed data collected from learner registrations and learning group creations from March and April 2020 and compared it to the previous 12-month averages. The IDEA program is carving out these evaluations as an overarching goal. We don't stop at delivering education, we also seek to understand how it works. This is the first of many evaluation projects that will contribute to an important body of knowledge about the real impact of e-learning in the infectious disease domain. Before we dig into the data, here's a high-level summary of the results of our evaluation. We saw an increase in the number of new learner registrations by month compared to the previous 12-month average. We saw a substantial increase in the number of new learning groups created by month compared to the previous 12-month average. Nearly a quarter of these new learning groups created in March and April 2020 cited the COVID-19 pandemic as the reason for creating their learning group. And these new learning groups leverage the e-learning platform in new ways that we had not seen in previous evaluations. For example, to fill in for undergraduate lab coursework and to replace in-person medical rotations. This chart shows the number of new learner registrations per month during the 12 months before the COVID-19 pandemic. The monthly average of new learner registrations during that period was 992. There was a 34% increase over that average in March and an 87% increase in the month of April. This chart shows the number of new learning groups created per month during the 12 months before the COVID-19 pandemic. The monthly average of new learning group creations was nine during that period. There was a 151% increase over that average in March and a staggering 254% increase in the month of April. 21% of the learning groups created cited the COVID-19 pandemic as the reason for creating their learning group. In total, 110 members joined these 11 groups. The reasons given for creating the learning group fell into three main categories. More than half of the learning groups were to fill gaps in undergraduate lab coursework, for example, STI labs. More than a third of the learning groups were to replace medical rotations, including OBGYN, 
adolescent medicine, and pediatrics. And finally, the remainder of the learning groups were to train staff during clinic closure. The staff were encouraged to complete relevant learning materials and continuing education courses that targeted the clinic's patient population. The learning groups used a wide range of creative educational strategies to meet their training needs. The undergraduate lab coursework learning groups required members to complete all seven self-study modules. The medical rotation and clinic staff learning groups, however, completed a mix of the self-study and the question bank topics. Only one of the medical groups, medical rotation groups required members to complete all seven self-study modules, and the clinic staff were allowed to select whichever self-study or question bank topics interested them. One interesting thing to note is about the undergraduate lab coursework groups. The use of learning groups at the undergraduate level represented a new demand compared to the previous 12 months, in which undergraduate level groups represented the smallest portion or only 10% of all learning groups on the national STD curriculum. The data from that evaluation is being presented at this conference as well in a poster entitled, Using National STD Curriculum Learning Groups to Meet Training Needs. So, in conclusion, the increased use of the National STD curriculum during the COVID-19 pandemic demonstrates the importance of having these types of e-learning platforms ready when training needs rapidly change. Also, the underlying infrastructure of the National STD curriculum enabled quick scale-up and creation of learning groups to meet highly dynamic learning and instructional needs in varying settings. Finally, as I mentioned before, stay tuned for more evidence-based data-driven evaluation on the science of e-learning and infectious diseases as we work to contribute to the growing body of knowledge about the real impact of e-learning in the infectious disease domain. Thank you very much for your time today. Visit the National STD Curriculum at www.std.uw.edu. And please feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions. Thank you. Hi, I'm Roxanne Karani from the University of Washington, and today I'll be speaking with you about decreases in reported STI cases in King County, Washington during the time of COVID. The Seattle area was home to the first reported case of coronavirus in the United States towards the end of January. This was followed in the end of February by the first recognized death from COVID-19 in King County. In mid-March, Governor Jay Inslee restricted gatherings of more than 250 people and schools in the state began to close. In, on March 23rd, Governor Inslee issued his stay at home order, which is the equivalent of a shelter in place order for Washington state. This slide shows coronavirus cases over time in King County, as well as the timeline that I just walked through along the bottom of the slide. We have entered a phase 1.5 reopening in King County, which started at the beginning of June. Also, during the shelter in place order, the sexual health clinic reduced or halted screening visits for patients and then resumed most of those services just before the county started reopening. Our research questions for this presentation are, did trends in gonorrhea and syphilis decline concurrent with social distancing guidelines? And to what extent did decreased availability and or utilization of STI services contribute to the declines that we may see? We looked specifically at urethral gonorrhea among men because it may be an indicator of sexual behavior changes because urethral gonorrhea is often experienced with symptoms and we would expect that men with urethral gonorrhea will seek care. In contrast, we looked at non-primary, non-secondary syphilis to get at screening changes because by definition, non-primary, non-secondary syphilis is asymptomatic. Our methods include our data sources, which were STD, STD surveillance data for the county for 2018 and through 2020, our sexual health clinic EMR data for the same period. We looked at gonorrhea, urethral gonorrhea among men, early syphilis and non-primary, non-secondary syphilis in our surveillance data. Again, we looked at urethral gonorrhea because, among men because it's experienced with symptoms for the most part and non-primary, non-secondary syphilis because it is asymptomatic. 
We look at three time periods for 2020. Period one is the pre-lockdown phase before the stay-at-home order. Period two is the stay-at-home order. And period three is the reopening of the county. We looked at types and, and number of sexual health clinic visits. We looked at treatment for gonorrhea with ceftriaxone versus ceft suffixing, and we looked at mean weekly case counts for surveillance data. We compared comparable periods for 2019 and 2020, and in 2020, we compared periods one, two, and three. Our analyses were primarily descriptive, although we used Poisson regression with robust standard errors to compare outcomes across the periods one, two, and three in 2020. These are some abbreviations that I'll include in my talk, including sexual health clinic, SHC, and NPNS for non-primary, non-secondary syphilis. Here are our sexual health clinic results. This slide shows total visits from January through July for both 2019 and 2020. The vertical dotted blue lines show the uh, bounds of the periods uh, for lockdown, pre-lockdown, stay at home, and reopening. The green line shows visits in 2019, and the blue line is visits in 2020. As you can see, there was a big decrease in visits during the stay at home period. And in total, we saw a little under 3,100 visits in 2020 compared to 4,600 in 2019. This was a 34% decrease. When we looked at the type of visits, that is when we looked at phone versus in-person visits, which we were only able to do after the beginning of April when we started tracking this, we saw that during period two, during the stay at home order, there were as many or actually a few more phone visits than in-person visits in the clinic. But in period three, the in-person visits started to go up again and phone visits dropped. When we looked at ceftriaxone and suffixing treatment for gonorrhea, we saw a large decline in ceftriaxone use from period one to period two, which has started to go up again in period three, with the opposite pattern for suffixing, which is shown in the blue line on this slide. In terms of King County STI trends, first this slide looks at gonorrhea. The red line are cases in 2019, and the green line is cases in 2020. You'll see for most of the STIs that the data for 2019 and 2020 are similar in period one, are different in period two, and then for period three, the um, 2020 data start to approach the two 2019 data again. We saw an overall 13% decrease in cases, in gonorrhea cases from 2019 to 2020. You see a similar pattern here for urethral gonorrhea, except there wasn't as large of a decline in the total number of cases between 2019 and 2020. For urethral gonorrhea among men, we saw a 7% decrease year over year. For early syphilis, Again, you see the same pattern of a larger drop during period two. Uh, there was a an 11 percent decline between 2019 and 2020. Non-primary, non-secondary syphilis has a somewhat different pattern in the in that while cases declined during period two, they also stay low in period three. And we did see that non-primary, non-secondary syphilis had the largest decrease from 2019 to 2020, a 34% decrease. When we looked at the time periods, that is when we looked at mean case counts for 2020 for periods one, two, and three, we saw that while total gonorrhea cases fell during period two, they started to increase in period three. In contrast, for urethral gonorrhea, Cases fell in period two and remained lower in period three. The difference between periods one and two and one and three was statistically significant for gonorrhea, and for periods one and two for urethral gonorrhea, it was significant. Notably, for early syphilis, mean weekly, gon or, sorry, mean weekly syphilis cases have returned to pre-lockdown or period one levels in period three. However, for non-primary, non-secondary cases, 
cases fell in period two and remained at the same level in period three, likely indicating that screening levels have not reached pre-lockdown levels in King County. The significance tests show no difference from period one to two or one to three for early syphilis, but significant differences for both comparisons for non-primary, non-secondary syphilis. In summary, compared to January through July 2019, in 2020, sexual health clinic visits declined by 34%. Sexual health clinic treatment with ceftriaxone decreased substantially while treatment with cefixime increased. Gonorrhea and early syphilis cases in King County were 12% lower in 2020, and non-primary, non-secondary syphilis cases were 30% lower during this time. The number of early syphilis cases that we saw before and after the lockdown in 2020 was similar, indicating that things are going back to normal to some extent. There are some limitations to this analysis. We're missing some data. We're missing any undiagnosed cases that are missed because of a lack of screening. And patients who are not tested but are presumptively treated will not be reported and so not counted. We cannot measure decreased STI services in other clinical settings, and although we normally collect quite a lot of sexual behavior data through our partner services interviews, that's become difficult because of the decreased number of partner services interviews we're able to do during COVID. In conclusion, symptomatic STIs in King County declined, likely reflecting some changes in sexual behavior. However, most of the observed decline appears related mostly to changes in access to and utilization of STI services. Reduced clinical services may actually result in increased STI transmission as we go forward. And our belief is that STI control will be further challenged by health department staff being deployed to COVID-19 work in the future. And so I've included this picture at the bottom of the slide to indicate how most of us feel running uphill in hot, dry weather at this time. I'd like to acknowledge my University of Washington and Public Health Seattle and King County co-authors and the STD Surveillance Network for funding this work. Thank you for your attention and please feel free to contact me with questions. I would like to take this opportunity to thank the organizers for allowing us to speak about our experience using our online outreach program, I Want the Kid, during the COVID-19 pandemic. I would also like to acknowledge the collaborators and co-authors of this paper, including faculty and staff from Johns Hopkins and the School of Medicine, and also the Baltimore City Health Department. I Want the Kid was started in 2004 with females participants only. Since then, we have expanded the program to allow for testing of more sample types, including extra general samples. We provide free SDI testing kits to residents from Baltimore City, the state of Maryland, Washington, DC, Alaska, and we also have a small program where we allow high school students from the Howard County to order an SDI testing kit to be delivered directly to the nurse's office. All samples are tested for chlamydia and gonorrhea, and recently we started testing all vaginal samples for trichomonas. Consistent with the goals of ending the HIV epidemic, we are now offering residents of Baltimore City the opportunity to order HIV home testing kits so that they can collect samples and do the testing at home. One thing to note is that we do not receive any kind of results regarding HIV testing at home using this program. Participants can go to iwantthekit.org and follow the simple steps outlined here to order a kit. The kit will be delivered to their home. They will collect the samples at home, mail the samples back to the lab where they will be tested for STIs, and the results will be uploaded to a secure website where participants can go and gather the results if the results are positive, their participants also select a clinic where they can go to get treated. The privacy of participants is important to us, and so all SDI testing kits are mailed in a discrete packaging, the picture that you can see to the left, 
All kits include all the necessary supplies that the participants need to collect samples, including swabs, information as to how to collect the sample, and also a prepaid cardboard envelopes where participants can return the samples once they have collected them. Due to the COVID-19 pandemic, I Want the Kit was forced to shut down on March 16, and then we reopened on April 6 to be able to allow participants or clients going to the Baltimore City Health Department to be referred to us for testing because the Baltimore City Health Department at that point, the clinics were closed. And so with that, the objective of this project was um, to test the feasibility of using I Want the Kit as a replacement for in-person visits for those patients that were supposed to be going to the Baltimore City Health Department. And we also wanted to use this opportunity to describe any changes in users for I Want the Kid, those changes such as gender, race, sexuality. And in order to do this, we use historical data pre-COVID, and then we compare that to data that was collected during the COVID-19 pandemic. In order to do this, we, in collaboration with our partners at the Baltimore City Health Department, develop a workflow to allow for participants going to the clinic to be referred for testing through I Want the Kid, and they follow the same protocol as any participant with I Want the Kid in terms of signing up for a kid, collecting the samples at home, and then sending the samples to the lab to be tested. After that, the patients received the results and they either call the clinic for follow-up or a clinician reach out to the patient so that they can be treated. So in terms of results, what we noticed was that we have seen an increase in the number of kids that have been ordered compared to data from the pre-COVID-19 era when there was only 133 orders per month but we have seen that in April, May, and June, we have seen a significant increase in the number of kids that have been ordered, including 396 kids in June, um, associated with almost a 300% increase in the number of orders that we have received. Another important thing to know is that we have seen an increase in the number of orders from residents in Baltimore City. Pre-COVID, only 22% of the total orders that we received were from residents in Baltimore City. However, during COVID, that number has increased to 54%. Consistent with the changes that I talked about before, we have also seen an increase in the number of OraQuick HIV home testing kits that have been ordered to I Want the Kid. When we first initially started the program in January of 2020, the number of kids that were ordered was relatively low at about 26 kids per month. But we have seen that the number of kids that is being ordered throughout when the kid continued to increase throughout the month, including in June where we saw a 565% increase in the number of kids that were ordered. Another change that we noticed was the change in gender identity pre-COVID compared to COVID. If we look at the numbers from September 2019 to February 2020, the majority of participants identified themselves as female. However, during the COVID era, what we are seeing is that we are seeing more males requesting SDI testing kits. The other change that we notice is that we have seen an increase in the number of trans and non-binary participants that we are serving. In terms of racial identity, that is another area where we have seen a change. When we look at the numbers pre-COVID, we, we can see that the majority of participants who requested kids throughout with the kid identified themselves as white. What we have seen during the COVID era is that the majority of participants identified themselves as black. And now we're seeing that 63% of the participants identify themselves as black. In terms of the age distribution, the majority of participants seeking STI testing kits are between 25 and 34 years of age. We also see a small number of participants that are between the ages of 18 to 24, and we are working to increase outreach to that population. 
Another thing that we try to monitor through the website is how do you hear about I Want the Kid? If you look at the numbers from November through February, you can see that most of the participants indicated that they heard from I Want the Kid by another source or others. However, when you look at the numbers from April to June, you can see that the majority of participants are now saying that they will refer to I Want the Kid by Baltimore City Health Department staff or through their website. And we can see that the numbers have significantly increased where over 50% of the participants that we see indicate that they were referred to I Want the Kid by the Baltimore City Health Department staff. In terms of the number of STI tests that we are conducting, uh, pre-COVID, we were averaging about 175 tests per month. But here we can see that every month, the number of tests that we are performing continue to increase, including a total of 418 tests that we perform in July, which is our highest number to date. In terms of positivity for chlamydia and gonorrhea, we did not find a difference by comparing the historical data pre-COVID to the data that was collected during the COVID area. However, when we look at the distribution of general versus extra general infections, we can see that during the COVID-19 pandemic, we are seeing more extra general infections, including an increase in the infections for males associated with rectal gonorrhea. And overall, we are seeing that we're seeing an increase in the percentage of extra general infections compared to the percentage of general infections. So we see more extra general infections during the COVID era that we have seen before. Therefore, in conclusion, I have shown you that I Want the Kid has been able to leverage STD testing um, during clinic closures of the Baltimore City Health Department and also during the COVID-19 pandemic. We have seen an increase of 300% in the number of orders, an increase of greater than 200 in the number of SDI tests that we are performing every month, and an increase of 12% in extra general infections. Consistent with the goals of the ending the HIV epidemic, we are targeting um, populations such as we have seen an increase in the number of blocks of participants that identify as black who are requesting STI testing kits and also the population of Baltimore City. However, during this time, we encountered some challenges, including limited supplies to swaps that are necessary for participants to collect samples at home, and then also having the necessary staff to conduct the testing in the lab. Thank you so much for your attention.